So in this lesson, we're going to continue our discussion of a subsampling design by looking at the statistical model, the ANOVA, and an example. So let's start with some parameterization uh, notation and re-looking at our car example. So again, we're going to be focused with the CRD with subsampling. You can, again can add subsampling to RCVDs, GRCVDs, and et cetera, but we're just going to focus on a completely randomized design. So our parameters are little t for treatment. That's the same as we've seen with the CRD. Little n for number of replicates per treatment. So this is going to tell us our total number of EUs is capital N equal to little n t. And what's new here um, is this little s, which is going to represent the subsamples per EU. So the total number of observational units is going to be little s times big N. So previously, we only had one observational unit per EU. And I what I mean um, previously, I mean before this lecture, the last lecture. But now we have our observational units, which are multiples of our experimental unit. And again, we're going to be focused on the balanced design case. In our car example, we had T brands, so A, B, C, D, E. We had two cars, so our total number of experimental units was 10. For each car, we had three test drives, and so our total number of observational units was 30. For our subsampling, when we were running the same car three times, we are not getting more information about the experimental condition we're getting more information about that car and the precision that estimate of that estimate. So how, again, we are collecting gas mileage. So how we're kind of getting a measure of variance or precision on the mileage for that car. So it's not more information about the experimental condition. It's more information about that specific car in trying to get a more understanding about the variability of the of that specific car. So, so subsampling is going to give us more precision on our measurement of the observation. Okay. For our summary statistics, we're going to have three subscripts where I is going to represent the treatment, J is going to represent the replication, and K is going to represent the subsample. So, boom. Now let's look at the statistical model. So previously, when we had a completely randomized design without subsampling. So little side note, when we had a CRD without subsampling, our model looked like yij equal to mu plus alpha i plus epsilon ij, where we had the grand mean. It's going to be the same in this case. We have our treatment due to uh, the treatment effect due to treatment i, and then we had an error. Okay, and this was representing our error for the experimental units. But now which we're still going to have. So this is going to be the error for the experimental units. But now what we're going to have is an extra error term for our observational units, which we're going to denote. Ooh, that's not center. Which we're going to denote as eta. OK, so what's happening is from our CRD, we're taking this error and we're splitting it up into an eta or an epsilon and an Eta. We need to be able to break it up so we have the observational error represented by our error and our experimental unit error. So now that we have multiple runs per car, we can look at those multiple runs, i.e. the subsamples, where we expect all the runs to be the same. They won't be the same because of random uh, variability. So we can now estimate that. So we can now estimate the variability of that car's gas mileage 
estimate. So again, in our previous lesson, we only had this epsilon, which would follow a, and we only had to estimate this sigma squared through the MSE. So this would be through the MSE under the CRD. But now we have an extra, this is our extra variance component for the observational units. And this is the cool thing about subsampling. We can now separate it and look at the variance due to our experimental units and the variance due to our observational units. So that's pretty cool. Well, at least I think it's cool. Um, we have our parameter estimates here. And then we have our total sums of squares that we would have seen in the CRD. So these should look familiar. But what's happening now is that for our error, sums of squares of error, we're going to decompose it so that we have the sums of squares for the experimental units. And then we have the sums of squares for the observational units. Okay, and then we have our sums of squares, or our, yep, our sums of squares for both of those right there. So, again, you won't have to memorize or be able to write this down. What you will have to understand is the fact that our sums of squares, our total sums of squares errors is being, is being decomposed now into experimental error and our observational unit error. These sums of squares are now going to come into play with our ANOVA table. Here. And so before we only had one error in the CRD, but now we have it broken up into our experimental and observational. Here's the question that we now have to figure out. We have two errors. Previously, we would just have MSE by itself, MSE, and we would divide by that. Now we need to figure out what error, this one or this one, do we use to divide our MST to figure out what our F, op, our F statistic is. And so do we divide by this MSEE -E or do we divide by MSOE? And in order to figure that out, we want to go and look at our expected um, mean squares. So again, our overall idea is to test these effects. Is there effect versus there, there is an effect versus there is effect. And our question that we're gonna look at now is do we use this F statistic or do we use this F? So our expected mean squares for our treatment, again, I don't expect you to, de to derive this, is this. This is our M expected of MST. And under the null, we would say that our alphas are equal to zero. And so that would go to zero, which would then leave us with this chunk right here. And so if we look at our expected value of our MSEE -E and our expected value of MSOE, which one of these two matches that? Well, it's this one. And so this is gonna tell us that we want to divide our MST by the MSEE -E. so that when our treatments have no effect, this goes to zero and this will go to one, similar to what we've seen in our previous lectures. This won't match. So our test statistic for our subsampling design is our MST divided by our MSEE. -E. Okay, and again, same thing that we've done before, we're gonna reject the null and conclude there is a treatment effect if our F observed is greater than our cutoff, or we can use our p-values and reject that way. So let's go to 
an example. So again, we're back at our car example. Our hypothesis is the alphas are equal to zero or there's no treatment effect. And then the alternative is that at least one of them doesn't equal zero or at least one of them differs from zero. So there is a treatment effect. We run jump or R and we would get an ANOVA table. The ANOVA table in our software isn't going to be this pretty. And so that's why I put this here so we can really make sure we're understanding what we're doing. We have our MST. Here's our MSE -E and our MSOE. This test statistic comes from this divided by that, and then we get our p-value. So we can see that our p-value of 0 0.0018 is less than or equal to our alpha, which we're going to say is 0 0.05. So we're going to eject the null, and the brand of car seems to have an effect on the gas mileage. So at the end of lesson A of this week, we talked about how we could do the analysis with averaging. So we just average, and we would get the exact and if we did that, so rather than doing a subsampling design like this, if we were to just average these points and run a CRD, we would get the same F statistic. And I will demonstrate that to y'all in the R slash jump software videos. But what subsampling gives us is the ability to get these two different errors. And that could be beneficial if it's, in, is, if it's of interest in your research question. Additionally, with subsampling designs, you can go through your contrasts. So we can have our contrasts. And whatnot. Again, subsampling, you can incorporate it into other designs to incorporate subsampling, subsampling into other designs. It's all about splitting up that um, error term in the statistical model so that you have your epsilon and eta your experimental unit error and your observational unit error and going through it. In each case, regardless of your design, you would still want to be dividing your F statistic by your MSEE, -E, your experimental unit. Um, yeah, now the question that we might wanna ask ourselves is, okay, we know about replication, we know about subsampling, do we want more EUs? So do we want more replication or do we want more OU? So do we want more um, subsampling? More experimental units would always be preferred to more observational units if possible because the error is going to go down for an increase in replication compared to an increase in subsample. You also want to be careful with that. You can't just what I mean, you want to be careful with just increasing your replication. If you just randomly say, I'm going to get a thousand samples, your p-value is going to shoot way down just because of how p-values work. The more, as n goes up, your p-value is going to go down. And so it's also why we want to do um, sam uh, sample size calculation. We want to make sure that we're doing the right thing and we're just not getting a bunch of replications. In our next lecture, we're going to look at variance component estimation. So how do we actually estimate um, these two terms right here? So how do we estimate sigma squared epsilon and sigma squared eta? So that's going to be our next lecture.